What's up all you Minties? This is the Uncanny Omar from Near Mint Condition and join me today as I take an advanced look at some of these trade paperbacks from Marvel Comics. So, please stay tuned. Welcome back everybody. Before getting started, a huge thank you to David Gabriel for sending us an advanced copy of all of these trade paperbacks coming out on March 3rd in the direct market and then of course a couple of weeks later in the book market. We've got a couple of epic collections, one big reprint, and some new trade paperbacks of ongoing series from Marvel. So, let's go ahead and get started with one of my personal favorites, Maestro. So here we have Maestro, Symphony, and a Gamma Key. Or Maestro para las personas que hablan en español. So this book retails for $15.99. So what is this about? When I was um, talking about the books coming out in March... I forgot that I had the first issue of this, and I freaking loved it, and I can't believe that I forgot it was a thing. So this is written by Peter David, Herman Peralta does the artwork uh, for most of the interior, and then you have the pretty much the, oh man, how do I do this without giving anything away, the things that came before drawn by Del Kion, who is a phenomenal artist all on his own but is probably known best for working with peter david on hulk and then of course he went on to do uh, pit for image comics but he draws this intro scenario where we have hulk sitting down at a table with his kid and his wife and not everything seems to be what it really is captain america shows up the avengers show up and they're like hey none of this is real bruce you got to get back to reality so if you've read Hulk Future Imperfect, if you're a fan of Peter David's Hulk run, he introduced this character of Maestro to the mythos of Hulk. And it's a possible future where Hulk isn't as good as he once was, or now he's known as Maestro. And this is literally the beginning of that storyline. This is how Bruce Banner, Hulk, became the character known as Maestro. And we see a lot of familiar faces throughout these pages. And I just wanted to show off some of this phenomenal, beautiful artwork by Herman Peralta. So, as you can see, he doesn't look like the way that you remember him in Future Imperfect yet. He still has a lot of his hair, but that beard is growing out and it's getting grayer and grayer. So this does take place in an alternate reality, in an alternate future, if you will. And like I mentioned, you'll see familiar faces throughout this book. You'll see a lot of surprises coming here, and then a lot of characters acting out of character. There's a lot of heartbreaking moments for some of the characters that were once a part of the supporting cast of Hulk. And things I didn't really think they would go a certain way. Totally did, because it's Peter David. Completely fools us. And I don't want to spoil any more of that. But just in case, let's go back to some of this. It's a beautiful... Wonderful story. All five issues of the miniseries are collected in here. Uh, retails, like I said, for $15.99. Has 128 pages. And this is mostly what the artwork looks like. With the exception of the... I don't want to really call them flashbacks, but let's just say... Uh, possible past that Del Kion drew. And they're throughout the whole five issues. Now, let's look in the back here for some extras. So, of course, we have some variant covers... And this is probably what most people remember Maestro looking like. Guy with a beard, bald head, looking older. Some more variants. And then, of course, some concept artwork over here by Herman Peralta. Really dig that Becky Cloonan picture. Let me make sure there's no spoilers for any character. There are a couple spoiler sketches here, but I'm going to skip those so you can be surprised who else shows up. But I've already you've already seen old Modoc who looks creepier that way. I didn't think he could get creepier. And then over here, you saw Aaron Stack, Machine Man. And Janice does come back because she was part of Future Imperfect. I'm pretty sure most of you probably guessed she was going to be in here. And I'm not going to reveal who that is. Savage Avengers, Volume 3, Enter the Dragon. Spoilers, there's a dragon. This is the ongoing series written by Jerry Duggan. And you have Butch Guys on artwork here. But then you have the return of one of my favorite artists, Patrick Searcher, or Patch Searcher. Adam Gorham also providing the artwork for issue number 12. But this is a match I never expected to see here. Doctor Strange and Elektra. All right, cool. Whatever, they're teammates, and now they're together, 
And, of course, things are happening throughout the Savage Avengers. There are a couple of things in here that I really enjoyed. You know, honestly, all these comics, it was a lot of fun to read comics for the last couple of days. Um, sometimes, you know, I, I forget how much fun I have with these characters that have been around for a long time. Or, I remember thinking how ridiculous the concept was of Conan showing up in modern day and joining the Avengers. I hated that concept. I'm like, no, Conan needs to stay in his own age. He's he's a Sumerian. He has no business running around New York or hanging out with Wolverine. And honestly, after reading the first volume of this, let me show you some of the other artwork in here. It grew on me. This is Patrick Searcher. Like him teaming up with Wolverine. This is an awesome team up, by the way, when he teams up with Magic, when they go and get the Juggernaut. There's a couple of other surprises here, too. Who else shows up? But I did want to show this awesome page right here of Conan just waking up after a night of partying and being, why would this guy not hang out with Wolverine after partying this hard? By the way, this leg, nice touch what happens later on. Like, oh, anyway. Yes, so there is a team up. You also have the return of Kulan Goth. Like, he is, he's planning something and scheming something, of course, that will eventually involve all of these Savage Avengers. Now you have the return of Sh Shumagorath, and Shumagorath is dying. And normally that would be an okay thing in the Marvel Universe, but something else is going on. And of course, you've got Black Widow in here. Like I mentioned, Hellstrom and Wolverine, uh, Brother Voodoo, Magic. Magic is such a fun part of this. And this is the part I was talking about when they're going to go get my boy here, Kane Marco. Um, and he, re rem he reminds Magic that she's the one that ripped out the Ciderac gem from him. But let's keep going. I don't want to spoil who else shows up here through these pages. Uh, the book retails for $17.99. And has 136 issues. And this collects issues 11 through 16 of Savage Avengers. There's some awesome artwork in here too. A lot of kick-ass pages. Alright, let's look in the back here for extras. We have a variant here by Lionel Francis Yu and Suni Go. Here's a Boss Logic Doctor Strange variant. And then we have... Oh, that's beautiful. That's a Mark Go Chichetto piece right there. And there's your dragon. Wolverine... Now, the next story arc, I think, involves the King in Black, so it's going to be a crossover with that event. All right, here we go. Doctor Doom, Bedford Falls. Now, this book retails for $15.99 and collects issues 6 through 10 of Doctor Doom. I will be completely honest with you all. This is written by Christopher Cantwell and artwork by Salvador La Roca with Guru FX as the colorist. Now, I will be 100% honest with you all. I have heard so many mixed things about this, mixed reviews about these books. Like some of some of my subscribers, some of you all have told me that, hey, this book isn't that great. I can't believe Marvel did this to Doctor Doom. And then some of you all have told me it's amazing. It's a wonderful book. It's a wonderful portrayal of Doctor Doom. And I, I, going into these books, I always try to make up my own mind. That's why when people ask me about a certain book, I'm like, yeah, I feel this way about it. But remember, you still have to read it. You know, you got to make up your own judgment on these stories because there's things that I like that I know a lot of people don't like and things that I'm not a fan of that a lot of people love. So, you know, everybody has their own opinion. So I went into this with just completely blind. I was not expecting a good story. I mean, when you have Triumph and Torment and the Books of Doom, you know, you have two of the best Doctor Doom stories ever. So it's hard to live up to those kind of expectations. So... I have not read volume one. I had no idea what was going on at first, but you know, I'm just the average comic book reader that can catch up based on what's happening in this issue. So this kicks off, like I mentioned, with issue six. And by now it seems like Dr. Doom has just left Latveria and he's going on this road trip with Kang the Conqueror. These two of my favorite villains, my favorite Avenger villain, Kang the Conqueror. And it's like a buddy road trip. Like they're both talking about the their inevitable betrayal to each other. So that's a nice little touch. They both know where they stand. They're after this weapon that's actually part of the X-Men lore. And the weapon is going to help Doctor Doom go back to that area. Oh, I don't know what it was about this, but I really had a lot of fun with this. And I'm not going to show you what happens at the end of this particular storyline. But right here in issue 7 when Doom returns to Latveria. 
You know, you have all these characters that have appeared long in the past or just recently in the pages of Dan Slott's Fantastic Four. But when you have Doom show back up riding a bear, I thought that was the most kick-ass moment of this book. And I'm like, okay, I'm sold. Please don't tell me this book is canceled. Because there's a lot of things in here that were a lot of fun. Like, Doom's voice himself, yeah, I think, actually... This is the guy that's going to be writing Iron Man. I haven't read the new Iron Man run, the, the trade paperback that comes out later this month. Now I'm excited because I thought he has a good understanding of who Doom is and what he does and all the politics that take place in Latveria. This was such a good book. I've really enjoyed it. Now, I haven't even talked about the other plot hole or the other plot device that's going on. And that's a big wormhole that the good guys have created on the moon. So the Blue Marvel is there. So is the Fantastic Four. Uh, they team up with a villain to try to solve it. But all the blame was put on Doctor Doom. Anyway, you can probably tell I had a lot of fun reading this. Um, that's why I said, you know... Maybe try to read some of these stories on your own, despite of what you hear online, because I mean, that's that's what happens, right? Like, when people ask me my opinion, I always tell them to at least give it a try. Just because I don't enjoy something doesn't mean you won't. There's a nice butt shot right there of the blue marble. It's got, honestly, even Salvador La Roca's artwork, who's turned more like Greg Land in the last few years doing the, the light box artwork, where he's pretty much just taking pictures and drawing on top of them to look like comic book art. Even his artwork in here is actually pretty damn good. Now, I miss the days, of course, of Salvador La Roca doing just pencils and then the colors on top of the pencils, like in the pages of Extreme X-Men. But that's just my humble opinion. Let's look in the back here for some extras. Censoring the final page, of course, to show one of the variants here by Miguel Mercado, who I thought was Simon Bianchi. And then the Clan Shelby Phoenix variant. Now, Doctor Doom does not get the Phoenix Force in this book. It's just that's what Marvel was doing with all the variants. They were giving the characters the Phoenix Force. Look how badass that is. Now, the book has 112 pages, retails for $15.99, and again, collects the 2019 series of Doctor Doom issues 6 through 10. Now, in the comments, please let me know that this is still ongoing because I was trying to find issue 11 to read it digitally and I, can't, I couldn't find it. So, yeah. Please don't tell me this has been canceled. All right, here's the part of the video where you pause this, put me on mute, whatever it is to look at these spines. By the way, we just hit 40,000 subscribers. Thank all of you. Thank you all so much for subscribing and being part of the channel. It's been a blast. So I will talk about, I'll do a separate video announcing the when the giveaway will be and uh, how you can enter and find out information, but yes, thank you all so much. You are a big part of this. All right, let's keep going. The Amazing Spider-Man Last Remains. This is volume 11 of the Nick Spencer run that kicked off in 2018. And this is a big deal. This one's this one's big. This is uh, retails for $17.99 and collects issues 50 through 55 of the Amazing Spider-Man series by Nick Spencer. Now, before going into this, I do want to say I'm going to talk a little bit about some spoilers. So if you don't like any spoilers at all, big or small, in the description of the video, I always put the timestamps. So if you want to skip this and move on to the epic collection I'll be talking about next, feel free to do so. If you don't care about spoilers or so you've read this stuff, let's go ahead and talk about this. It's not a big spoiler, but I always like to warn people ahead of time. All right. Last Remains. What is this about? Uh, the very first thing I want to say is that this is the big kickoff of Patrick Gleason as the new ongoing artist on Amazing Spider-Man. And you also have the return of Mark Bagley. Mark Bagley's been supplying artwork for Amazing Spidey for a while now. So, this is the spoiler I was going to talk about. This is Kindred. Now, I'm not going to reveal who his identity is. That's a big uh, moment in here, and I don't want to spoil that for anybody. Uh, but I do have to talk about his powers and what he's been doing. So that that's the spoiler I want to talk about. So ever since Nick Spencer took over Amazing Spider-Man with that first issue, uh, Kindred has been the character that's kind of been playing the puppet master behind all these things that are happening. Resurrecting characters, killing characters off. Uh, he resurrected recently the Sin Eater. And the Sin Eater was going around and killing people or just... Uh, forgiving them for their sins, if you will. It's a pretty interesting and complicated storyline, considering it's Amazing Spider-Man, right? You're used to guy just being able to walk on stilts or walking around with adamantium Dr. Octopus arms. But this guy seems to come from hell and is able to resurrect people from Spider-Man's past. 
and knows who Spider-Man is. That's the big clue there, too. He knows the secret identity of Spider-Man, and he has this grudge against him. Uh, yes, you, you have the return here of Norman Osborn, who played, yes, this part here towards the end of the last story arc. So, that's what he's doing throughout this volume. He's trying to destroy the character of Spider-Man by resurrecting loved ones from his past, putting him to blame for everything that he's done. And then Spider-Man, of course, has to go and get help from the Sorcerer Supreme, Doctor Strange. But it's never that easy, because it... It never is that easy. Now, the Order of the Web comes back and helps him out, but they're all attacked by Kindred. So they get turned into something completely different. They turn against Peter Parker, and all of the Order of the Web is now after him. So that's what this story... And this story is dark, honestly. I, I had a lot of fun reading this. And it ends on a damn cliffhanger, just like uh, the previous chapters. I want to know what happens next. It... it so, uh, without going into spoiler territory, I had a lot of fun reading this one. And there's some beautiful artwork in here. Patrick Gleason, of course, killing it. He drew uh, those issues of Superman. He's been around for a long time, but he's just now new to Marvel, coming in and drawing Amazing Spider-Man. And it's always good to have Mark Bagley back uh, on artwork as well, even if he's just, you know, filling in an issue here and there. The guy is super fast. Kindred, the designs of him has always been really creepy. And this is no offense to somebody like Ryan Otley. I really enjoyed Ryan Otley. His artwork on Invincible is what made Invincible great. And then when he took over Amazing Spider-Man, I thought, man, that guy's artwork actually fits the tone of the book. And he can carry a monthly schedule. But Gleason, I mean, the guy's on another level. So uh, you are in for a treat if you've not read this. And for those of you that are here watching this, because you don't care about spoilers, do yourself a favor and still read it. Now, I've not heard any word of this being collected in oversized hardcover or an omnibus format, so, so far, the only collected editions we have of this run are in this trade paperback format. Now, let's look in the back here for some extras. So, in the back here, we have lots of variants, making sure that none of these are spoilers. Of course, they fool you when they give you art like this. None of these characters show up. Well, maybe one or two do within the uh, pages of this book. That's an awesome picture right here by Ivan Coelho and Gabriel De Lotto, always kicking ass. All right, let's keep going. Captain America, Captain America Lives Again. This is volume one of the Epic Collection. Now, I need to make a disclaimer like I always do when I talk about these Epic Collections. This is my first printing. Uh, mainly, this is just to show you what the artwork looks like and what to expect. The newer printing, I'm not sure which printer is printing it. But this one was printed by the R. Donnelly printer when it first came out. But the new printing, uh, it might or may not be printed there. Now, here are all the contents and, of course, the credits right here, written by Stan Lee, Roy Thomas. And, of course, on artwork, you have Jack Kirby, John Romita, Gil Kane, just to name a few. So, kicking it off with this interesting story right here, this is Strange Tales number 114. Now... I don't, I remember reading this the first time and I was like, what the heck is this doing in there? Well, this has the fake Captain America. So Johnny Storm is facing this, his arch nemesis that he's fought before. And it turns out that Captain America is not the real Captain America. Because even the whole time Johnny Storm's like, this can't be the real Cap. This isn't who I used to read about in the comic books. So what Marvel was doing, this is really cool. Down in here at the end is, you know, Johnny Storm reminiscing about how great Steve Rogers was and how much he misses him and how much he wishes he would return. And at the very end, it says, you guessed it, this story was really just a test to see if you two would like Captain America to return. And as usual, your letters will give us the answer. That's an awesome gimmick. Like, not really a gimmick. That's just really cool to connect with your audience like that. And then, of course, Captain America did come back. So this epic volume one, for those people that have been asking me, are they ever going to do Golden Age epics? Probably not. They'll, if they ever do Golden Age Captain America, it won't be part of the epic line because I seriously doubt those could be collected in like a volume zero or 0 0.5. They'll probably do some kind of classic collections in trade paperback format. Of course, we have them in Masterworks and in Omnibus Editions, uh, but epic volume one kicks off with the Silver Age. So here it is. The Avengers, 
Issue number four, how they find Captain America frozen in ice, what it has to do with the character of Medusa and all that. You can, not Medusa, the Inhumans, like the original Medusa. Anyway, you can find that stuff all out by yourself. So we go from Strange or tell, uh, Strange Tales 114 to Avengers number four, and then we get Tales of Suspense 58 through 96. Now, if you remember Tales of Suspense, it was shared between Iron Man and Captain America. It wasn't until issue 100th of Tales of Suspense that they changed the title to Captain America 100. So, Tales of Suspense was Tales of Suspense all the way up to issue 99. And then in issue 100, it became the title Captain America. So, that's why when you try to go and find a Captain America 1 in the Silver Age, you're not going to. But here it is. Here we are introduced to the character of Captain America outside of the Avengers. There's a big long story arc in here that's a flashback to him we're also introduced to a couple of his loved interests like uh peggy carter uh sharon carter which later on becomes agent 13 uh his team up with nick fury they're all in here most of the stuff of course supplied by the phenomenal jack kirby and then uh john romita gil kane they also do some fill-in artwork you have the cosmic cube being manipulated by the red skull which is the cover to right here of course the cover was uh recolored those are not the original colors uh now the original color uh cover that's in here are not recolored they're the original colors that you found within the covers as they came out so um as i was saying yes a lot of characters are introduced a lot of backgrounds are filled in what happened to bucky barnes they're all told through these pages and how captain america is dealing with living in modern time and what happened to some of his friends from World War II? Should they be dead? And even the question of the love interest, right? Like what happened in this and, and when I think when Peggy was first introduced, she wasn't named at all. Like she didn't have a name. And he's wondering, like, why didn't she come and find me if she's still alive? She must have heard that I'm back. Oh, Captain America. You poor sap. So this is what to expect. Oh, yes, right here. The Avengers. Uh, yes, right here, the team up with Quicksilver and Scarlet Witch, who are a big talk right now because of that small, tiny, little Disney Plus show called WandaVision. There's the Super Adaptoid whenever he fights him. Uh, Modoc makes his first appearance here. Not that that's a big selling point to some people. Uh, and then the Avengers also show up from time to time to team up with him. And, of course, the covers are complete. You get every cover. Even if it doesn't feature Captain America, it still has his name. And also Iron Man, of course. And as far as the price of this, this is $39.99 and has 488 pages in it. Let's look in the back here for some extras. As far as the extras that we have here, we have original artwork here from Tales of Suspense. I swear every shot I see of Batroc in here, he is just jumping feet first. And then more original pages. Now, of course, the ad in the back of the new printing and in the front are going to be completely different because we have so much more epic collections. So the new printing will be out on March 3rd. Last but certainly not least, X-Men Epic Collection, The Fate of the Phoenix. This is Volume 7 of the X-Men Epic Collection line and collecting the years 1980 to 1981. So for anybody that has read X-Men, you all already know that this is probably one of the most important, if not the best epic that is coming out this year this not only has the complete dark phoenix saga but also the days of future past storyline so how how do you put two phenomenal stories together into one epic it just so happens that it, it was mapped out that way so kicking it off with the uncanny x-men not officially called uncanny x-men at the time just x-men adjective x-men 129 to 143. It was in issue 142 that the title officially became Uncanny X-Men. It also contains annual number four, Marvel Treasury Edition 26 through 27, Phoenix, the untold story. I can't believe that's collected in here. That's crazy. Very cool for those people that have never read that. As well as material for Marvel Team Up number 100, which is the uh, 
the story that was collected in the new omnibus with T'Challa and Ororo Monroe. So you kick it off. Now I can talk about each single issue, but I don't want to bore you with that. Let's talk about just the pretty much the premise of this. If you've never read the Dark Phoenix Saga, we've done an old reader, new reader on it, where my two beautiful, lovely co-hosts, the amazing Amanda and Wonder Manny, broke my heart. And I was drinking in that episode because it was my birthday. I remember well. And told me they were not fans of the Dark Phoenix Saga. What? <laughs> what? Anyway, kicks off with the introduction of Catherine Kitty Pride. Uh, her mutant powers have just been activated. We are also introduced to the White Queen, then he, the the Hellfire Club, Dazzler, and with all that, we're also seeing Jean Grey having these weird flashbacks and talking to this one guy named Jason Wingard, and he's pretty much just manipulating her into becoming the new Black Queen because he wants to use her powers. So that's that's pretty much what makes her snap. And then Phoenix, this is when she had the Phoenix power, eventually becomes the Dark Phoenix. And there's a trial by combat. And oh my gosh, this freaking story arc is so awesome. So literally it goes from 129 to 137. That is known as the Phoenix slash Dark Phoenix arc. There's my boy Angel. This is how you used to say hello. What's up, girl? What's up? While his girlfriend is right, right behind him going, Oh, Warren, you're such a flirt. And, and, and on top of that, Cyclops, what's up, man? How's it going? And he's like, move, man. Let me go and say hi to Gene. What's up, Gene? How you doing, girl? Puts up. Anyway, where the hell was I? Okay, yes. Oh, the beautiful, wonderful scene right here where she's able to just hold back Cyclops' optic beam. Because if you know Cyclops, whenever he takes off his visor, he doesn't have any control of his power because he fell off an airplane, hit his head on a rock, and bang, he is completely handicapped when it comes to controlling his power. So he has to have constant use of his visor. And Gene is like, no, I can control it. And he's like, no way, you're not that powerful. And he's like, holy crap, you can. What is the extent of the Phoenix's power? Oh, dude, my turn. Issue 133. Wait, wait, wait. The best setup right there. When the Hellfire Club kicks the crap out of the X-Men. They knock out Wolverine, throw him in the sewers. And he turns around, and he's like, all right, y'all took your best shot. Now it's my turn. What a badass. And then we get the first ever, ever Wolverine solo story where he just goes berserk on the entire Hellfire Club, taking out all the minions. Oh, man. If you've never read this, you're in for a treat. I said I would not talk about issue by issue, but I'm, so I'm going to move ahead. Here's the trial by combat when the Shi'ar is like, hey, Phoenix, you went crazy and did something horrible. You can't be forgiven for that. You must be punished and you must be destroyed. The X-Men are like, nah, -uh, not on our watch. That's our girl and we watch our own. So we're going to fight. So the Imperial Guard fights against the X-Men for the life of the Phoenix or Jean Grey. And well, I'll let you figure out how that outcome is. And here's the annual where you get a past story of Nightcrawler and some of his heritage perhaps. Features Doctor Strange, and then of course issues 140 and 141 where Wolverine changes his costume to the golden brown outfit and the fight with the Wendigo. These are creepy stories actually. And he changes his costume, well, he never really says why, but something that happens in issue 137 makes everyone that's read X-Men believe that's why he changed his costume. And then of course you get the phenomenal Days of Future Past, which back then was only a two-issue epic event. It's crazy. You know how Marvel is releasing all these X-Men epics? Or, I'm sorry, Mar Marvel milestone or X-Men milestones, rather? You would have only two issues collected in the days of future past because it was that damn good and you only needed two issues. Nowadays, we'd have 30 issues of crossovers to tell this story about a possible future and how the Sentinels are killing everybody. So Kitty Pride has to travel back in time. Her mind, rather, has to travel back in time to take over the body of 13-year-old Kitty Pride. And to warn everybody of what's to come. And then it ends with the classic issue 143. With that little demon they got away from issue 96. Whenever that portal broke open in the X-Mansion. in the, Well, not the X-Mansion, but in the backyard. What are these demons called? The uh, Ingar, Ingari? Something like that. If I remember correctly. And then you have the extra stories back here. Phoenix, the untold story. This shows you how they originally wanted to end the story arc of the Dark Phoenix Saga. Let's look in the back here for some extras. So you have 
original art. Oh my gosh, that's awesome. These are original art pages in here from John Byrne, Terry Austin, Chris Claremont. I think that to me was always the original team supreme. I, I loved the Chris Claremont, John Byrne, and Terry Austin years. So unused artwork, of course. There's a lot of extras in this book. So the book retails for $39.99 and has 480 pages. Classic. House ads and pinups. I'm not going to go through all of this, but let's see. Okay, here are some collections of like the classic storylines collected in trade paperback format and just double size single issue format. Lots of trades of the. I mean, the Dark Phoenix is one of the most iconic X Men stories, so it's been collected over and over again, as well as Days of Future Past. I've always loved that cover from the small trade paperback. And then the Masterworks. But that, as they say, is that. Now, when these books come out, don't forget to check out our sponsor, CheapGraphicNovels.com, your online source for collected editions up to 50% off retail price. Cheap Graphic Novels prides itself on excellent packaging, so your stuff gets to you in excellent condition, and they have amazing customer service. Check out their bargain deals for up to 90% off cover price. And for all you minties that are watching, if you're a first-time customer, don't forget to mention that Near Mint Condition sent you their way for a promotional credit on free shipping on your next order. Now, this is only for U.S. customers. CheapGraphicNovels.com, your source for the hottest books with deep discounts, customer service, and excellent shipping that will keep you coming back for more. And that was the content and the page count of each of these books. Let me know in the comments down below which ones you're picking up. If this is the way you're collecting X-Men, because this is probably one of the best epic collections released this year. If you're happy about the reprint of the Captain America, Captain America Lives Again epic collection. And if you've been reading any of these recent series, which ones you're planning on collecting in trade paperback format. Honestly, I really enjoyed these. That's just my opinion, though. So it was really fun. It was a fun uh, couple of, last couple of days to read comics again. Again, this was the Uncanny Omar. Thank you all so much for subscribing, for liking the videos. We just hit 40,000. I'll be doing a thank you video and announcing when the giveaway will be. But thank you all. We couldn't have done it without you all. Again, thank you to David Gabriel and Marvel for sending us advanced copies of these books. And more importantly, all of you, stay healthy, stay safe out there, and much love. <laughs>